Let's be honest, large language models are getting really, really good at writing code. You can spin up basic CRUD apps, make single page websites, pass unit tests, and even refactor code with just a couple prompts. Here's the thing, I don't think this means that software engineers like you and I are done for at all. I think this actually puts us in an even better position than we had before. Instead of just writing the same boilerplate code 100 times and wasting 95% of your time writing unit tests which continually fail, now we can move ourselves higher up the chain and work on designing entire systems instead of focusing on the nitty gritty of every single line of code. In this video, I'm going to break down why AI is really good at writing code, why those powers don't translate to system design, and how you can take advantage of system design to explode your career. So why is AI so good at coding? To me, the reasons are pretty simple. First of all, coding has an extremely short feedback loop. AI can write the code. Does it compile? If it compiles, that's a good start. Next, it can run the unit test. Do the unit test pass? If they do, great, your code works. If they don't, okay, back to the drawing board, let's make some small tweaks, and we can quickly iterate on that code until it works. This means that if you have unlimited money, you can sit there and let your AI agent run for eight hours, and it will eventually get to a solution for your problem that probably works. If you wanna take this one step further, you can write your own unit test, not let the AI edit those files, and make sure that it can get that code working before you let it finish any given task. This makes coding with AI extremely efficient. The second reason large language models are so good at coding is the sheer amount of great code on the internet that they have been trained on. Think about all the open source repos with tons of code, excellent hygiene, methods, object-oriented programming, you name it, it's all there. In addition to this, we have Stack Overflow, we have entire books, and pretty much code examples for everything you would ever want. So when you ask it how to add a print statement to your code or do something like implement cores, there's hundreds of thousands of examples where it's seen this and it basically just has to copy paste that code into your code base. And finally, most code tasks have a right enough implementation. If you have a function where you specify the input and the output and you don't care too much about performance, the large language model is definitely going to be able to get there, especially if you give it a clear acceptance criteria in the form of unit tests. Now to me, this is great. Let's let AI deal with all that boilerplate and crush that so we can move ourselves up the stack. Now here's why system design is completely different. If you don't know what system design is, it's the process of creating architectures for large scale software systems. This includes things like selecting what database you're going to use, defining API endpoints, defining how data moves between different parts of your system, and how everything interacts with each other and deploys and scales. So how come AI isn't good at this? The first reason is because the feedback loop is extremely slow. When you go to design a system, you have to consider all the components, the users, the scalability, and then you finally go about implementing your system, which may take six months to a year. Once that's all done, it could be multiple years until you find out if your system was successful or not. Was it able to scale to 10 times more users? Was the database schema flexible to allow for new use cases while rigid enough to prevent bad data from getting into the system? There is no test system button that you can immediately run to see if your system scaled for all these possible use cases and unknown unknowns, which you as the architect have to consider from the get-go. Now two, system design is all about trade-offs. There is no right answer and everything we do has a cost. For example, if you want to increase availability, you might have to increase latency or sacrifice consistency. There's also huge cost considerations and we don't have all the requirements up front for what our system needs to be able to do. Number three, the constraints of system designs are often extremely messy. You might have to work within a framework of a bunch of legacy systems that include code or packages that haven't been used in 20 years. Additionally, we have to consider things like how many developer resources do we have, what technologies are our developers familiar with using, and what languages do they know. There also might be things like internal data compliance standards that we need to adhere to, or different politics we have to play just to get the funding for the service we want to build. We also have to consider year-over-year -year operational costs and if we have on-call resources available to support this system as we move into the future. These aren't neat problems in a training data set that an AI can easily pick up and quickly iterate on. These are human problems that we as a developer have to navigate and solve. And finally, we're designing for change. We don't really know what workloads our system is going to have to support upfront. Yeah, you can take your best guess, you can make a business requirement stock, and you design for the initial features. And we have to do that, but you also have to design with scale in mind every single time. Don't over-engineer, but consider how your system might be extended for future users. Here's a simple example of the long-term implications of a bad design decision before we move into how you can learn more about system design. Imagine you're creating the backend for a social media app like Instagram. You might choose a NoSQL database like DynamoDB, and you might partition your data by something like the user ID. For the first two or three years of your app, everybody's just using the app to make friends and talk to each other and follow a few of their friends, so this works pretty well. Your partition pretty evenly distributes the amount of users, as each user maybe has 100 followers and they get 100 likes per post. Now, as the system evolves, let's say we get someone like Taylor Swift on the app, 
Suddenly, every single user on our app wants to follow her, and that partition of our database is blowing up with traffic. Now users can't see her posts in real time, other parts of the system might be collapsing due to uneven load, and we have to do the worst thing in software engineering, a database migration. No unit test could have warned us about this because this is a result of the interaction of real users, our servers, which might have been able to scale, and a single part of our database which couldn't scale. Now, an AI who designed the system could not have possibly found that out within the first 30 minutes of design designing the system or while you were prompting them because the failure didn't emerge for multiple years after the design was shipped. Where traffic, scale, and downstream service level agreements interact is where we get the most difficult problems in system design. So let me take you through my framework of how I look at these problems far in advance and solve them to become AI proof. When I design systems, I look at every single decision we make through five lenses. You can use these as kind of a checklist or cheat sheet next time you have to review someone else's system or design one yourself. The first thing I consider when examining a single part of my system is the workloads and access patterns that this piece of the system is going to be affected by. Are we expecting more reads or more writes? Is there some reason that a certain part of the database would become hot or get more requests than the rest of it? Are we expecting smooth traffic or bursty traffic? Is this an application that's only gonna be getting used 12 hours a day or are we expecting 24 hour traffic from global users? Now, the next thing I look at is service level agreements and failure modes. Here's where we can define things like how much our service will be available, let's say 99.999% of the time. How durable is your data? Is your data going to be preserved if some of our systems crash or is it going to be lost because it's stored in memory in one single server? We also have to ask questions like which piece of our system is going to fail first and when that piece of the system fails, what's the blast radius for that? And are retries item potent? And do we have back pressure and timeouts in place across the entire system? The next thing I always think about is data and consistency requirements. What is our source of truth for data? Do we need strong consistency, meaning that every read reflects the most recent write no matter who's doing the reading? or eventual consistency, meaning that you write and somebody might not see that until a little bit later, but this will probably reduce our latency. And if we need to migrate our schema or rebuild indexes for whatever reason, how feasible is that? If we're expecting the schema to change, this is a pretty important consideration to take into account right up front. Now, the next thing to consider is the cost and evolution path. How much is this system gonna cost to maintain and run? It's great to do everything in-house to save money, but if we can do it on AWS and save for the dev resources, we might as well do that. Additionally, how much more cost are we going to incur once things start to scale? And is our design even scalable at all? What does the system look like at 10x traffic or 100x traffic once we start getting more and more users? And do we have the ability to swap components later? Do we have versioning on our APIs so we can roll out a backwards incompatible change and still leave customers using our old stuff in place without disturbing their use case? Do we have an MVP of this that we can roll out now and see if it's working to shorten the feedback loop on this entire design? Now lastly, we have to consider our team of developers and the reality of the org we're working in. Are we proposing a completely different tech stack than what everybody else is using? Are we building a new microservice that doesn't need to be built just to get somebody promoted? And do we have the correct observability metrics in place so that when somebody gets paged on call, they can get in and fix the system quickly without having to dig through millions of database entries? While system design is a critical skill to have if you want to get into big tech or propose functional systems at a large company, you can do it just for a personal project or if you're working on your own startup. Here's exactly what I would do if I wanted to get a little bit more practice in the space. First, pick a simple product. This could be something that you've already built or something that you've been thinking about building. You don't need to have all the technical skills to implement the entire thing, but something that you clearly understand. Two, put together a product requirements doc. This should include things like the functional requirements of the system, like users can log in, users can order things. Whatever the system needs to be able to do from a user's perspective should be included here. Also include the non-functional requirements. The system should be available 99.999% of the time. If a user logs out or closes their Chrome tab, their cart should be preserved. Three, draft a design doc. This is where you can do your traditional system design with your box and stick diagrams. Define the API endpoints, what technologies you wanna use, what's gonna be hosting your servers, and what's gonna be storing your data. Make sure you consider things like, should my API be asynchronous? Should I have a cache here? And then determine what amount of load you want to simulate on this service because you might not have to actually implement this if you're just doing the design. So design for different levels of scale so you can get practice with every type of load. Once you're done, take your entire doc and give it to an AI agent to propose three different alternatives so you know what you're up against. Sometimes I'm pretty impressed with what the AI comes up with and I might take one or two of their suggestions. Other times it's all complete garbage and I rest easy. Now, if you really wanna keep learning, I recommend that you and your friends all do this and then have a mock design review together where you each critique each other's designs and examine which different parts of the design might fail. I'm working on putting together a community where folks can do this. So if you're interested in something like that, check out the form in the description down below. 
At the end of the day, you can think of system design kind of like city planning. You get to make high level decisions like where should I put the highways, where should I put the houses, and where should I put the office buildings. But you won't know if you nailed it until there's a rush hour or a snowstorm hits or a big person comes to your city to have a concert. That's why this is a good role and good space to be in. Not because it's easy, because it's complex. So let the AI write the code and you design the system. The future belongs to engineers who can think six to 12 months down the line and make difficult trade-offs. If you wanna dive deeper into this, check out the rest of my YouTube channel and I have a free 50 page PDF you can download in the description down below, which walks you through the basics of system design. Let me know if you guys have any questions and follow for more.